Hello everyone and welcome to EPR's Power Talk on Green Energy, India's Shift to Renewable Energy. According to MNRE's latest announcements, India's cumulative installed renewable energy capacity has crossed the milestone of 100 gigawatts. While 100 gigawatts has been installed, 50 gigawatts is under installation and 27 gigawatts is under tendering. The achievement of 100 gigawatt installed renewable energy capacity is an important milestone in India's journey towards its target of 450 gigawatts by 2030. Another industry report by Global Wind Energy Council and MEC Intelligence indicates that India is expected to add nearly 20.2 gigawatts of new wind power capacity between 2021 and 2025. This would increase the country's 39.2 gigawatts wind market by nearly 50% and is a clear signal that the market is beginning to bounce back after a slowdown in recent years. While these numbers open up new avenues of growth for renewable energy in India, the journey ahead could see many opportunities associated with some challenges as well. So delegates, it's an honor and privilege for me to introduce you to our today's distinguished speakers. Mr. Sabya Sachi Mazumdar, Senior Vice President and Group Head Corporate, Sectors Rating, ICRA. Mr. Ajay Devraj, Secretary General of Indian Wind Power Association. And Mr. Kashish Shah, Energy Finance Analyst and Research Associate and Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Welcome, Mr. Majumdar, Mr. Ajay, and Mr. Kashish to this uh, forum of discussion. Uh, let's begin with Mr. Majumdar, uh, this discussion. Uh, India's renewable energy sector has scored a century, as we uh, spoke in the beginning, uh, with installed capacity crossing 100 gigawatts and the target of 175 gigawatts capacity set to achieve by 2022. You know, uh, uh, thanks for this opportunity. Obviously, you know, it's a very uh, big achievement. I mean, that there was a point of time when uh, maybe up till about 10 years back where, you know, uh, renewable energy was really seen more as a tax management exercise. I mean, you know, we started out with wind energy really largely and at that point of time, you know, uh, it was seen more as a tax management tool rather than an energy generation tool. But now, incrementally, we are seeing the fairly large percentage of the total energy is coming from the renewable energy and this trend is only likely to continue. So, definitely, from that perspective, it's a very uh, critical achievement, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, uh, critically important achievement for the sector for ensuring us to have a clean, uh, you know, uh, clean development process. Now, going forward, of course, uh, uh, you know, this year, as we have already discussed that we are now, uh, you know, given what has happened in the past year, we are not really expecting a very huge, so I don't think 170 gigawatt is going to happen by March 2022. Uh, but, you know, I have a slightly different perspective on the capacity addition. You know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, many speakers here will speak about, you know, uh, you know how we can reach 450 gigawatt or whatever that number is. But, you know, as a rating and, you know, as a rating analyst, I want to have share a very different perspective. Now, what I am, as a rating analyst, what, uh, you know, interests me is not so much, you know, actually how many gigawatts we are going to achieve. What really interests me as a, you know, credit analysis, whatever gigawattage that we add, that should have a tariff which is uh, high enough for the company to remain, uh, to business to remain remunerative, but at the same time, it should remain low so that the discom or the ultimate optical, whoever is it, whether it is the discom or whether it is the, uh, you know, the third party consumer, it is uh, remunerative for him to also source power from this. So that is the first thing. Second thing is, whatever, you know, gigawattage is added, it should, uh, you know, earn enough uh, so that, uh, you know, it is able to service all his debt and also he gives some return uh, to the equity holders so that he has a motivation to remain, you know, invested and keep supporting the project. So really, I mean, as a credit rating analyst, it, uh, you know, uh, you know, interests me more as to how much you know additional cap that we should ensure that whatever capacities we add every year uh, is easily absorbed by the system in the sense that it generates power when the grid needs and at a price that the grid can afford it and at the same time you know enough money is made by the uh, you know developer so that he is able to uh, you know service his uh, capital whether it's equity or debt 
So at this point of time, we are really looking at about 15 to 20 gigawatt is something that we, uh, you know, feel that uh, you know the system can absorb. And of course, as and when you know there's a change, for instance, there are changes in let's say uh, you know technology which brings down the fundamental cost of generation. Plus, you know, storage solutions, whether it's in the form of hydrogen, whether it's in the form of uh, pump storage, or whether it's in the form of battery, whatever it is, uh, you know, it's able to, uh, you know, uh, ensure that you know some of that power is stored and uh, you know sold at a time uh, to the users when they need it. And finally, the overall energy demand growth. So these three are the major factors which will determine how much you know capacity which can add on a sustainable basis. And that is something that we should, uh, you know, target rather than, you know, saying that we should add X gigawatt by so many years. Yeah, that is a valid observation from you, Mr. Majinder, yes. from a practical uh, perspective. Uh, let's also see what Mr. Kashish has to say on this. Yeah, I um, echo with uh, the thoughts of uh, Mr. Sabisachi. Uh, in terms of um, um, thinking about the capacity, I see two key driving factors. Um, for the capacity additions is one one of them is obviously electricity demand growth um, in my optimistic view um, let's say we um, recover from the covid pandemic and if our uh, electricity demand growth uh, can remain at let's say six percent for the for the coming decade um, yes definitely uh, that sort of capacity will be required the capacity the energy capacity that offers um, ultra low cost cost tariffs which are again competitive uh, with coal-fired or, or gas-fired power plants, um, and that that's going to increase the standard asset risk on, on thermal power power plants. And I see thermal power plants playing sort of a second fiddle role on the on the electricity uh, on on our grids. So uh, to to answer the question um, in short, yes, this target could be delayed by let's say a couple of years, two three years. Uh, but uh, at some point, I would I would um, imagine uh, that renewable energy capacity will accelerate at the pace which is required to achieve 450 gigawatts or, or somewhere near that. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kashish, uh, for sharing your uh, uh, outlook. Uh, Mr. Ajay, what is your view on this uh, market update uh, from a wind, per, uh, wind power perspective specifically? Uh, see, the point is that uh, reaching these targets is, I would say, premised on a few points. One is the thing of, uh, like, during the pandemic and even now, we are facing uh, problems in terms of transportation and getting things down to the site. So that is one thing that is an issue. The second thing is that uh, though talented people are available, they're not available in the right place. In the sense that, you know, like they have moved away uh, uh, to other uh, companies or to other locations, they're not available at the site to actually take care of the execution. So, like we have had several of our members stating that there is a problem when it comes to the thing of actual execution. And therefore, it's going to uh, create a problem to be achieving these particular targets. Uh, the 2022 target originally was supposed to be achieved by 31st March 2022. At some point in time in 2019, the ministry clarified that no, when we're talking of 2022, we are talking about 31st December 2022. Okay. So fine, they expanded the date. But well, then I don't think that is going to make any significant difference in the ability to achieve uh, the target that we are talking about. Yeah, Mr. Ajay, when we talk about achieving the targets, uh, we are we are ongoingly uh, in expanding our uh, generation capacity, especially even in RE. Is it consistent with the power demand what we have in domestic market? Yes, it certainly is consistent because the power demand is growing. Yes, we did have a hiccup uh, courtesy the pandemic-induced lockdowns, but we are seeing that thing uh, sort of changing. The other thing is that if you look at various corporates, uh, be it the Amazons of the world or uh, Infosys or ITC, they have all committed 
to switching over to 100% renewable energy at some point in time. So that certainly augurs very well when it comes to the thing of demand for renewable energy. Okay, so that is very optimistic. One of our delegate, you know, uh, put a question in the chat box. Uh, he wanted to know uh, whether our government, uh, you know, what is our government stand in having international collaboration in renewable energy technologies, in wind energy, for example. Uh, there may be excellent scope in composites, surface engineering and structural uh, integrity condition, uh, you know, so monitoring. Yeah. So, uh, does such collaboration tend to be at the state level or commercially specific? See, one thing is uh, that I think uh, as far as international collaboration is concerned, there is no problem at all. We uh, have uh, welcomed technologies from different parts of the world. The only thing that we're saying is that whatever you do, do it in India. You want to manufacture, manufacture in India. You want to provide a service, provide it in India. So that is the only thing I think the government is actually saying. But uh, it, it, it uh, has not come in the way of saying that no, 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 protectionist kind of a thing we will not allow. Yes, it did happen, I think, for a short time for this uh, solar PV. Like uh, geopolitics, so to speak. But I, I think that is probably a short-term phenomenon which will resolve itself over a period of time. Uh, Mr. Kashish, uh, when we focus on the power generation capacity uh, augmentation in renewables, it is also important to have uh, storage facilities and distributions in a you know uh, a better way, effective way. How do you think the storage and distribution network in the country currently are better prepared to handle growing uh, the RE capacity? In terms of so the question is, are we prepared for it? So um, I made pretty clear from my presentation that right now the costs are prohibitive if you look at uh, the prices globally. Uh, in terms of preparation, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I need to acknowledge the fact that uh, that there is to, to develop any industry, specifically an expensive industry such as battery storage, there will be a bit of handholding required from the government. Uh, now, what we see uh, from SECI and NTPC's um, mega tenders is the same fact that these um, government-backed entities with great credit profile, they're writing down these contracts uh, on their own balance sheet. Um, what will happen with this is um, developers will obviously participate in SECI and NTPC uh, tenders and then there is um, in the initial stages of, uh, of this sort of development there will be some cost of learning which will be which will be expensive so we've seen uh, another tender maybe a year ago that was done by SECI which differentiated um, off-peak and peak tariffs now uh, the peak tariffs uh, um, uh, in a competitive auction came around to somewhere around uh, US $65. If you compare that with um, any other uh, tariffs in India at the moment, where there is no peak or off-peak differentiation, that is expensive. Uh, but once uh, the developers, they have um, learning um, learning by doing experience with these expensive uh, tariffs, and then uh, as we, we, we sort of bring economies of scale, we have um, the, the production link um, uh, incentive schemes, and also uh, globally, uh, when battery prices do come down, uh, I think India, Indian developers or all the Indian market will be ready to absorb that sort of uh, battery storage uh, uptake uh, at the right price. Uh, that is my reading of the situation at the moment. Mr. Sabisaji, are you there? The question is, many state-owned discoms are dealing with weak financial conditions. And you also mentioned right. in your uh, PPT very clearly that, you know, how important it is to be financially viable. Uh, how can this be challenged to renewable power deployment in our country? You mentioned that it is one of the critical aspects for the growth of uh, renewable energy as well as meeting the targets. But how far it is critical? Essentially, it's very critical because you see, uh, the thing is, uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, there are certain states which are paying on time, right? There are certain states where there are prolonged, uh, you know, delays, uh, delays of payment to renewable energy. And we are aware that, you know, all these companies, you know, developers, they are winning projects uh, through the competitive bidding rule. And we know what has happened on the tariffs. 
so it is not that uh, you know developers are working with a very high return on equity and the return on capital is generally high single digit or low uh, double digit so if on top of that you know there are prolonged uh, you know period prolonged periods of uh, you know payment stress from the discounts uh, what will happen is that even whatever returns they are getting that will get further squeezed because uh then you know the you will have to either the promoter has to put in money to support the liquidity of the company or he has to borrow from the banks and uh, pay the uh, pay interest on that so that will definitely very strongly impact the overall return so under this and it will also discourage you know developers from uh getting into more and more projects now for the time being of course they are going through you know ntpc or seki but at the end of the day they are also you know intermediaries only if discoms uh, you know a, a large number of discoms uh, you know right now you know fortunate situation is that at any point of time there are only two or three you know states which have large delays the others have manageable delays but if fundamentally you know the financial position of a discom remains weak and if large numbers of them you know start delaying even you know seki ntpc and you know players like that will have great difficulty in terms of uh, you know uh, you know paying the developers on time so from the overall perspective i think it's very important for uh, the sector as a whole that discoms become financially solvent uh, sabhi sir when you said about you know discoms becoming financially viable see yeah. uh, it also sometimes contradict uh, the government policies or the encouragement see one of the delegate already posted one of uh, feedback mr kiran is talking about that we have the highly high target to achieve truly the policies are encouraging small capacity uh, for, for small capacity investors in 2013 we had uh, somewhere on 180 plus investors and today we have around uh, he says around 10 investors or less than 10 investors in wind energy and uh, how do you uh, respond to it is it something so, that we talk about the delay payment no no see the number of investors has come down because it is now becoming a big boys game because uh, you know the economies of scale are there so obviously there is a consolidation in the industry so you know uh, once it's a basic uh, change happened after the bid uh, you know we move from the feed in tariff to the bidding rule once uh, the bidding comes only someone who has access to large amounts of capital at very fine rate they, uh, you know because capital cost has now become the key uh, you know success factor in this industry key differentiating factor because the other things like you know technology uh, you know operating uh, onm practices and other things these are highly i mean yes obviously you know you can uh, do a little bit of tinkering around the edges you can always you know do some uh, you know fine tuning and all but at the end of the day uh, you know those are more or less commodities so uh, ultimately it becomes a question of you know uh, financial muscles who has access to more capital at a finer rate they are the ones you know who can uh, we know win large numbers of bids so that is why the number of uh, investors has come down but doesn't necessarily mean that uh, having a lesser number of investors doesn't mean that it's going to impact us from you know Uh, growing the overall because those few investors can really pour in large amounts of capital for investment in the country yeah that makes sense and mr majumdar also mr kiran again posted a feedback to everybody on the same point uh, mr ajay would you like to add anything to what mr majumdar said right now? majumdar is perfectly right with the bids being a minimum of 50 megawatts like obviously the small players who were there earlier are no longer there If you look at the number of manufacturers there were, at one point in time we had 20 plus. Now we have about nine or ten uh, left. So that is one uh, sign of change. The other thing is states that have, shall I say, a good payment record, seem to be able to attract more number of uh, projects coming in in that state. One particular state, I will not name it. did go in for a bid not through seki on its own and did not get a single expression of interest so i mean thing is that uh, the thing is that you know like uh, uh, they said that okay we don't want 50 but we uh, will go for lower thing but even then people were not interested so uh, ultimately the thing is that you know like this thing will succeed when the state where you are investing in also has a credibility 
like the state's credibility i think matters a lot over here it is not just the cuf and yeah uh, i think that's the way the thing is going uh, right now like what we are uh, saying as i said earlier uh, during my presentation was that we are trying to reopen the sub uh, 50 megawatt category also because not everybody is a big boy and wants to be uh, putting in that much when you look at it even policies regulations and practices go hand in hand i mean having a synergy is most essential what we hear right now uh, mr majumdar do you want to add anything i i it felt that you were about to say something no i think i need to okay. add sure yeah. mr sudhir please thank you yeah sir uh, mr majumdar uh, i have one question how is the concept of uh, hybrid power in renewable energy uh, like uh, various combinations of wind and solar uh, like picking up in the country so basically it has just about started there are only very few projects which are operational but definitely i see a lot of interest on part of the developers because you know obviously you know there are teething issues which have to be sorted out and people have to find out what is the right combination of solar and the wind how to you know do the siting how to do the transmission lines how to site the transmission lines but uh, obviously it is seen that you know if the total amount of uh you know power uh, that has to be supplied from the renewable energy it has to go up it has to become hybrid because pure wind and pure solar is just too intermittent so we are uh, looking at, i mean we do know that most of the developers are looking at solar wind hybrids with some amount of storage as a way forward so it's early days but i think uh, i see a bright future for the segment ahead and i understand that most developers are looking at it very serious thank you uh, mr majumdar for uh, your update uh, mr kashish uh, what is your thought on this uh, when it comes to energy storage and when we you know produce more power in uh, solar and wind power and a uh, combination of these with storage battery storage how it works um uh, definitely i think that is that is the way uh, that is the way to uh, to go forward uh, it could be also hybrid plus um the battery storage as well and um i while i've uh, been talking about battery storage and the accuracy and speed that at, at which the battery storage can operate we should also um keep in mind pumped hydro storage is also uh, a very useful useful resource um in india i think pumped hydro storage uh, from from what i've um analyzed in terms of data i think there is about 7 to 8 uh, gigawatt of pump hydro storage but only 4 uh, gigawatt of pump hydro storage are operational uh, at the moment so a lot of these projects uh, they face operational issues and they also uh, face construction issues uh, just like other hydro projects uh, in india so i think there is um, if i think there needs to be um, focus on uh, uh, resolving some of these issues in pump hydro storage uh i i understand that it is it is a it is difficult some um some of the um mountainous terrain of of india where pumped hydro storage would be um uh, mostly um if not viable but um you know actually resourceful uh it's it's a difficult challenge uh but um while uh, battery storage prices come down pumped hydro storage also need to be looked at and uh, uh, i also believe that fcas market uh, the formalization of frequency control and ancillary services market will also provide uh, pumped hydro storage in other revenue stream right now most pumped hydro storage plants are operated by sta- uh, or, uh, or states just to uh, shave the peak demand uh, but it could also be operated as a grid management tool just like battery storage uh it's not as accurate and um speedy as as battery storage but uh it is an important uh, it can come uh, play an important role for for grid management yeah that is absolutely great uh, uh kashish thank you so much for adding this and uh, the panelists we have received almost half a dozen questions in our uh, q and a box i request uh, you to look at uh, the questions and if you can address that there itself it will be really great uh, mr ajay i'm coming back to you that you know uh, say we are looking at the uh, uh, future of india's renewable energy future of india's renewable energy sector which is taking power sector to green uh, how do you like to conclude this session the one thing is that uh, as larger quantities of renewable energy come into the grid there are issues 
relating to the very nature of wind and solar uh, which is their variability and the intermittency one way of uh, dealing with this is not to look at energy within the confines of state boundaries but to enlarge what we call the balancing area now this is a proposal that from iwpa we had made when the discussion was taking place regarding the new energy policy the you know, national energy policy and uh, like we'd like to state that uh, it found immediate acceptance at that level and they have said yes it is important that we increase the size of the balancing area in order to accommodate larger quantities of uh, green energy now that is one thing the other thing is that you have uh, uh, this regional power committees you got a southern regional power committee which covers the southern states based out of bangalore for example one thing that we have been discussing with them is the possibility of uh, working on swap energy swap between states now if that happens say uh, during the monsoon when a particular state has uh, a huge amount of hydroelectric power that is something that can be used in a state that doesn't have that particular thing or requires uh, something the other thing is that uh, probably I, i haven't seen too much of investment in gas based plants but if there is a sufficient thing of gas based plants they are pretty good at being able to be ramped up and ramped down to deal with the problems uh, inherent in renewable energy so i think there is a future for renewable energy definitely but one needs to take a holistic view of the entire thing to move it forward absolutely being a third largest producer of renewable energy india's renewable energy future is very bright uh, mr majumdar i would like to have your closing statement for this session so basically uh, you know uh, my uh, you know real take away about this sector for you know recent past has been that uh, you know this is the way forward i mean incrementally we will see uh, you know renewable energy contributing more and more uh to the overall energy mix so there is no question in the fact that uh, you know renewable energy is here to stay and to form a larger uh you know proportion of the total uh, you know energy mix uh the developments which are taking place like you know uh, evs or hydrogen or you know green power or you know uh, things like you know the green ammonia we are talking about you know turning everything into green and you know many other biggest corporates are uh, you know have uh, you know promised to become 100% renewable energy so green energy i am going to definitely seeing renewable energy a very bright future having said that there are definitely challenges in terms of winter how do we address the intermittency but i am quite optimistic that uh, technology will be there uh, but at the same time a very stable regulatory environment as well as uh, the financial viability of the discount is very important if you have to realize that the benefit potential thank you panelists for exchanging your valuable thoughts on green energy india's shift towards renewable energy we hope you have enjoyed the session before wrapping up today's session i would like to thank our distinguished panelists mr sabya sathi mr ajay and mr kathi i would also like to thank our executive editor of epr mr sudhir and our editor mr prasad nayar for taking this initiative so with this we would like to announce the closing of today's power talk i request you to stay tuned for more such sessions thank you and goodbye